Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back after our summer break. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that our meetings are web streamed and televised, and for those in attendance, I would ask to ensure that your phones are on silent mode. Uh, to the clerk, I did not close us out of closed session. Yeah. My apologies. I have a motion moved by Councillor Van Passen, seconded by Councillor Michelli, that Council open, reconvene in open session at 3.20 p.m. All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay, and uh, finally, a motion by Councillor Michelli and seconded by Councillor Van Passen that bylaw 2019-89 being a bylaw to confirm the emergency of council, meeting of council be adopted. All those in favor? And that is carried. And uh, now we're moving on to our regular council meeting. Um, so I guess before we begin, I certainly know the media and council are eager for an update on this week's AMO conference. So I'll take a few minutes to uh, relay our successes at uh, the event. Um, Councillor uh, Van Passen decided to come last minute, uh, as well as Councillor Martin and myself. And uh, Mr. Schlang was also in attendance. And we met with uh, a number of ministers, um, various delegations. Uh, we actually met with the Liberal Party as well, and we met with the Green Party. Uh, in each of those um, delegations, we talked uh, really about the gas well uh, situation and, um, you know, asking for their uh, support in this. Um, we also uh, spoke in depth about uh, our, our cannabis challenges here in Norfolk. Uh, we started out actually on the cannabis topic with the Western Wardens Caucus and I was fortunate, I believe our staff actually helped to uh, make this happen, but I had a presentation to the Wardens Caucus on that uh, cannabis and uh, it was interesting in the room how split it was. Either there was a complete lack of knowledge of a distinction between a licensed producer and a designated producer, of course the designated producers being the ones that are causing us the challenges. Um, and then the other half of the room uh, put their hands up saying, we too are suffering uh, the same problems in our community. And so uh, there is an appetite to be able to uh, band uh, together uh, to hopefully put some federal, uh, some pressure, not only on the federal government, on the licensing side of things, uh, but also on the provincial government uh, in terms of these doctors that are being, uh, that are issuing these you know, fraudulent essentially prescriptions, um, you know, for sometimes upwards of 500 plants uh, to patients for personal consumption. I'm pretty sure we all know nobody's smoking 500 plants of wheat. Um, we also, uh, unfortunately, Lori Scott was called away and we met with her uh, chief of staff um, and uh, really great news that came out of the government there was the one billion that's gonna be offered in the uh, community culture and recreational stream and that's going to be released on September 3rd with a green stream uh, to follow. Um, they seemed very excited about Norfolk's uh, proposal and um, some of the things that we want to do to be able to differentiate ourselves. Um, you know a big part of the talk was sort of proximity to you know other facilities and clearly we, we have a we have a very large community here and and so um, they were excited to learn more about the connections with Fanshawe and with Guelph University and, and really saw the potential there. Uh, we also um, met uh, one of our biggest ones and most critical was with the um, Minister Yakubuski with the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources uh, and the majority of that time was uh, spent on discussions surrounding the gas wells. Um, we explained, you know, we understand that there are some, some conflicting science out there, um, but it is our hope that uh, regardless of what their scientific sort of view is, that we have a serious problem uh, in Norfolk County, um, but it is also a serious problem uh, in, a, in southwestern Ontario, across the province, but uh, very definitely in southwestern Ontario. There are thousands of abandoned gas wells, and the gas well that we have and that's lying in an aquifer that's leaking is causing significant challenges, and uh, they seemed committed. Um, although the dollars haven't been fully pledged yet, they seemed uh, very committed to, to working with us on trying to resolve that solution. Um, there was also a lot of talk at the conference about the conservation authorities and uh, this government wanting to uh, reduce sort of double regulations 
and uh, we had discussions about uh, the need for some needing some shoreline protection in Norfolk County, uh, particularly along those areas where we're seeing some homes that are ready to fall off the bluffs unless we do something soon as a result of the high water levels. And uh, they were very, very supportive um, of us being able to uh, to be able to go in and do the work now and, and save those homes before it's too late. So that was extremely positive. Um, and what else am I, uh, I'm just off the top of my head here. I think, uh, and then finally I was put in, I guess, the bear pit for the first time at the end. So that was pretty interesting of the pushing and shoving and to get up to the microphone and running in. And uh, it was a little intense, but um, I think I was about sixth in line by the end of it. So that was good. And um, really got to pose the question to the government uh, about the designated producers and uh, what they're doing to, uh, what the attorney general is doing to regulate uh, these doctors. Again, I think there's a lot of, misunderstanding at the municipal level and I hope that that was an opportunity maybe to open some people's minds um, that wouldn't have otherwise known about it. No, oh, finally, we met with uh, Minister Hardiman as well and uh, put a big thank you and plug in for the the uh, research, uh, Guelph Research Station, um, which I think is a real gem here in Norfolk County and uh, the former manager from uh, the Vineland Research Innovation Centre is now working here in Norfolk at the Guelph Station and he, if you ever get a chance to go out there, um, he has big plans um, for that place and I think it's a, it's a really unique opportunity for us. And, uh, and also while we had Mr. Hardman's year, we talked about the bunkhouses and hopefully increasing uh, the numbers of uh, camp workers in those units from four to hopefully maybe a larger number so we can help our farmers out here in, in Norfolk address that need. So that's a, a wrap up from AMO. It was, um, it was really, uh, it was, it, I think it was extremely successful and uh, in fact we were even told uh, Councillor Martin and I um, personally that uh, the funding that we received for the Causeway Bridge was as a result of our presence at Roma so I think it's really encouraging and demonstrates the need for us to be uh, engaged in attending these events and thank you to Mr. Schlang for coming because Harry knew every single person there. <laughs> Councillor Van Passen? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would just uh, also like to say it was rather hectic. We had meetings scheduled not only on behalf of Norfolk County, but also with SCORE, uh, a lot of which were overlapping, so uh, we were bouncing back and forth. But I do want to thank our staff because uh, every presentation we made had a, a well-researched, well-presented uh, package that went with it, uh, you know, the handout to the, uh, the minister's assistant so that, uh, you know, it, our staff made us look good at AMO, uh, we did our job, and um, I just wondering whether if we can circulate all those packages just electronically to the rest of council, they can uh, have a little background on uh, what we were what we were politely asking the uh, government to uh, help us out with. So, thank you. And fi oh, it's finally, if I could just add one more piece, just for anybody that's watching as well, I can't even believe I almost forgot. But with the Ministry of Environment uh, delegation, um, we also. Uh, we talked about shoreline protection as well with them. Um, we were also hoping to be able to separate uh, the bridge from the Long Point Causeway uh, project so we can get on because it's, base it's almost entering an emergency state. And uh, we were informed in the meeting that in fact the environmental assessment was actually just completed. So uh, that's all great news on the causeway front. And they also seem to have a very uh, large appetite. I said typically municipalities get angry when the province wants to download uh, more stuff on them. In the case of the Turkey Point beaches, we actually want to help you guys out and take that off your hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, they actually seemed like they had an appetite um, for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, the reason why I had the mic on, we were finalizing all the documents as we were still going to Ottawa, but now they're all finalized. So we'll send you the copies of all the presentations. And, uh, and next year, you know, build on that. The real work starts now, I, you know, in the follow-up. And I've already met with a few of the uh, general managers and Marlene specifically with some contacts with the uh, assistant deputy minister, chief of staff of MNR. And I've also left um, the interim CAO coming on with a number of notes because the real, the follow-up now is really what's going to, what's going to make things happen for our folks. So, thank you. Any questions or anything from anyone? Uh, in that case, moving on to the agenda. 
Uh, if I could have a motion uh, that the agenda be approved as, sorry. There we go. Okay, so we have one addition to the agenda item 10, and that is a bylaw to appoint an acting treasurer, manager of financial services for Norfolk County, and to provide um, for the duties thereof. Um, with that said, if I could have a motion to approve the agenda as amended, Councillor Taylor and seconded by Councillor Guys. And so all those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, first item is uh, the consent item staff report DCS 19 30. That's in regards to special event temporary closers for the Delhi Fall Fest. Uh, motion's been moved by Councillor and Passon and seconded by Councillor Michelli. All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay, we don't have any deputations. Um, in terms of communications, first we have a motion moved by Councillor Michelli, seconded by Councillor Van Passen, that the West Quarter Line petition be received as information and referred to staff for an appropriate response. Councillor Columbus. Madam Mayor, just if uh, if uh, Mr. Baird can, uh, this pro this road's been requested for several years now. I did drive down it the other day, and it is rather choppy, and your your truck uh, kind of goes all over the road. Um, was this road uh, these people were told that the road was supposed to be done last year? Can you uh, elaborate as to why it wasn't done last year, or? We're, we're slated in the process and exactly what you think we'll be doing next year. Sure. Uh, through Mayor Chop, uh, staff are certainly aware of it. Um, unfortunately, the, the specifics of it where the, some of the homeowners spoke directly to the, the former area supervisor who has since retired. It was one of those projects that fell through the gap, so it didn't make that map. You may recall earlier in the season, you got a nice map for all the different wards and what was going on. Uh, it's certainly worthy of uh, reconstruction. And the plan there is to do uh, uh, some, some base uh, um, um, sort of a deep renewal, uh, new granular and tar and chip. So we've, we've made a commitment uh, on our list for 2020 that that will be uh, looked after throughout the limits that have been defined. I'm sure they'll be pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? And that's carried. Next uh, is the... Uh, beacon of Lights request. Um, motion has been moved by Councillor Michelli, seconded by Councillor Van Passen, that the Beacon of Lights request from the British Home Children Advocacy and Research Association be received as information. Any discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, next is the motion moved by Councillor Huffman and seconded by Councillor Michelli that the Lights and Sirens baseball tournament request for reimbursement be made for the diamond fees or be made for the reimbursement for the diamond fees be received as information. Any discussion on that? Councillor Huffman. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Now, in terms of just receiving it for information, how can we move forward with making sure that this uh, reimbursement takes place? I believe you would have to make a motion today um, okay. or you could raise it again in okay. the future. No, I'd like to put a motion on the floor then that we um, support the reimbursement of the uh, fees that were paid by this charitable organization. All of their money goes to, I don't need all that in the motion, do I, Andy? Um, that's part of the discussion. Uh, that I put a motion on the floor that we reimburse the group, the charitable group, for the fees that were incurred for the diamonds for this fundraising ball tournament. Okay, so can we, we'll just take a quick vote on receiving his information, get that out of the way. All those in favor? And then now you have that motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion on that? Councillor Columbus. It, it's odd that it doesn't mention what the fee amount is. And I was curious about that, uh, what the fee amount is. Does anybody? Um, through the mayor to Councillor Columbus, no, I, I do apologize. It was on my list to get that number and I haven't. Uh, received, a, 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 I, haven't, I haven't emailed a staff to get that number yet. Thank you. So I just have a question. I thought that we had made an agreement uh, by council that we weren't going to handle these on an individual basis anymore throughout the year because it was, and that it was 
just going to be uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, so we, we don't hear deputations on this anymore. And when we got this request, I advised um, the requester that it was unlikely that, that council would do that and also directed them to the grant process for next year. For next year, what we had done prior. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Chop. I, I too thought that this was in the, in the bylaw with our new plan. Um, I guess deputation versus putting something in writing are very similar for me. Of course, we want to uh, support this, but then again, you know, you sit and think about, you know, I'm, I'll use Port Dover as an example because that's where I live, but I know each and every community has this. The Port Dover Lions just paid thousands of dollars to rent the community center for a fundraiser that reaches far and wide. So um, I really would like to see a better system for how we tackle these. Uh, Councilor Columbus, I might have a question for you, actually. Would this be something maybe if we've kind of adopted that approach that we were saying, you know, we want people to come forward once a year with the grant process of, for the police services board? Isn't there a pool of funds? Well, I, I was going to mention that which budget does this come from? Is it the, the mayor and council budget where we get the grants out? Would that be where the dollars come from, Mr. Clerk? So like uh, Councilor Martin says, we, I thought we had a process laid out for all that. I, th I thought that was what we agreed, not just deputations either. I thought we said that we weren't going to, it was going to be once a year and that we would inform them of how to apply for next year so they were prepared and we would deal with them on an annual basis. Councillor Huffman? Through you, Mayor Chop. Um, I guess my question would be, and I do recall all of this and I do agree with it, Mike, the question would be how do we know that the public was duly informed of this new process? That's my question. And um, also, a question to Mr. Cridlin, is there any kind of, for lack of, um, I'm not trying to be very punny here, but a ballpark figure? <laughs> Mary Chuff, yeah, chuckling here. Uh, um, what I will do is I will have an answer within five minutes. I'll, I'll step out and make a phone call, and I do apologize. I should have had that number here to help the council make that decision. So are we okay just to come back to it then? Okay, we'll move on for now, and then we'll... So skipping on to item 60, um, a motion moved by Councillor Van Passen, seconded by Councillor Michelli that Dennis Trevally's Police Services Board Chair's communication regarding Council's policing priorities be received as information. Any discussion on that? I think that's something um, we obviously need to get uh, together. We'll have to call a, another meeting at some point to be able to discuss what those priorities are going to be. It's just been a busy time. Okay, all those in favor? And that's carried. Moving on to the approval of minutes, item number seven. Uh, we have that the, sorry, stand by. Uh, we have the July 9th and August 7th council minutes before us. Are there any errors or omissions? Councilor. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Trapp, through you. Um, Sorry, I had a question regarding the um, correspondence from Mr. Trevally. I noticed here that there is um, an invitation to all council members to an attend in a meeting on September 4th. Um, it doesn't say what time, and I'm not sure if it says the actual location, if, that could, if we could get a clarification on that. I'll have Owen email all council members. Okay, so any errors or omissions in the minutes? Councilor Adams. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you. There is an error, it's on page 18 of our package. Um, there's a motion, it's point three. It says Martin uh, firsting and Jackson uh, seconding. I believe that was a mistake. Uh, Dr. Richard Jackson was our presentation from the University of Waterloo. Uh, I'm trying to recollect who seconded that motion it could very well have been myself but uh, I think we need to look back into the maybe the tape or the minutes and just make that correction thank you Councillor Rabbits thank you Councillor Jackson okay um, so that will make that change and anything else okay we'll declare then the minutes as adopted uh, next moving on to the, the reports of committees uh, first, we have a motion moved by Councillor Van Pass and seconded by Councillor Michelli that the public hearing committee meeting minutes from July 9th be received as information. Councillor Columbus. Correct.
Councillor Michelli, he's beating you to the punch. Madam Mayor, I apologize. That got totally by me. <laughs> okay, we will make that correction. Thank you, Councillor Columbus. And Ma Madam Mayor, how do we know it wasn't a coup? It could have been an attempt. <laughs> Okay, uh, all those in favor to be received as information, and that's carried. Uh, next is uh, 8B, Health and Social Services Advisory Committee meeting minutes from May 16th, 2019. That they be received as information. Moved by Councillor Van Pass and seconded by Councillor Michelli. All those in favor, and that's carried. Tourism and Economic Development Advisory Board minutes July 29th, 2019. Be received as information moved by Councillor Michelli, seconded by Councillor Van Pass and Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Chop. I just have a question about this, and I see, unfortunately, I can't call on my colleague, Councillor Rabbits, but they're um, page 58, section 6A. I wondered if we could get some additional information brought back to Council. And on um, page 59, section 7D Youth Council. I would love to get more information circulated. That's all. Okay, so additional information on 6A on the Marketing Partner Program and 6D, 7D, my apologies, 7D. Could we send an email perhaps to? Mr. Hoskins to circulate some additional info? Okay, perfect. Okay, we move by Councilor Michelli, seconded by Councilor Van Passen. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, next is uh, that the Climate Change Adapt Adaptation uh, Committee meeting minutes from August 1st, 2019 be received as information uh, that's moved by Councilor Columbus and seconded by Councilor Rabbits. That needs Councilor Columbus. Madam Mayor, it mentions the Vice Chair being uh, Mr. Moyart, but I didn't see where it mentioned the Chair position being labeled. Sorry, where does it say that? Oh, okay. And the Chair... Doug Moy, or Councillor Michelle, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I believe Councillor Van Passen sits on that committee. Probably can clear this up. Are you the chair? Can we add that in there? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Columbus. All those in favor? Carried. Next, that the Norfolk Environmental Advisory Committee meeting minutes from July 8th, 2019 be received as information. Moved by Councillor uh, Columbus and seconded by Councillor Van Passen. All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, that the Recreational Facilities Advisory Board minutes from July 24, 2019 be received as information. Moved by Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Columbus. I saw a hand. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Through, um, through you, my question is, it's going back to the last one. Um, it's, we're moving kind of quick here, so I just want to, uh, I think I missed it. Um, under, under other business of the Norfolk Environmental Advisory Committee, I see that this Bridge 45 has been discussed again and that a notice of completion was discussed by Joe Murphy, no evaluation or public consultation has occurred, was just wondering if staff could give an update on that. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Chop, uh, to Council. The uh, revised notice of uh, completion was issued as, uh, as required. Uh, there were uh, three um, concerns expressed that went to a part two, uh, so that's forwarded to the Ministry for uh, further review. Once we hear back from them, we'll be able to keep moving forward with the work on that Bridge 45 project. As soon as more information is made available, my staff will be right on it, and uh, all of Council will be notified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Okay, um, over to Recreational Facilities again. Ian, or uh, Councilor Bravitz and seconded by Councilor Columbus. 
All those in favor? Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There is an error. It's on page 71 of our agenda. Next meeting uh, is not Monday, August 26, 2098. It's in fact, 2019, we'll be meeting uh, this upcoming Monday. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, uh, next, can move by Councillor Rabbit, seconded by Councillor Columbus, that the Downtown Simcoe BIA Board of Management uh, minutes from July 12, 2019 be received as information. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, now we're moving on to the staff reports, unless, oh, Mr. Kirtland's still not back, so we'll move on to staff reports. Um, first up is staff report ECS 19-38. That's in regards to the mileage analysis report. Shelly, is that you? Uh, the third one will work, I think. Uh, thank you, Mayor Choth and members of Council. As directed by Council on July 9th, staff uh, completed some preliminary analysis of when it becomes more cost effective to purchase a county vehicle instead of reimbursing employees to drive their own. Uh, the analysis was in consultation with uh, the departments uh, across the corporation. And for the purpose of the analysis, staff <coughs> mileage was used along with the cost of a small vehicle. It was determined that the break-even point is 14,800 kilometers driven. The review identified bylaw officers as well as building inspectors as prime candidates for the highest return on investment in deployment of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, with that, it is an information uh, report, um, and should Council direct anything to go further, uh, the capital budget is approaching as well as the operating uh, budget if uh, Council so desires. And with that, I'll lean on my colleagues to answer any specific questions with the analysis. Thanks, Shelley. Councilor Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I asked to get this report done because if we remember back in budget time, uh, I was tasked with the job of doing a fleet review of our equipment and this is the kind of piece of information that we need to look at while doing a fleet review, which by the way I haven't got too serious about yet because of uh, some other issues that are going on, but uh, it's the kind of things that, need, that we need to look at in, as a long term big picture thing and I appreciate it. Uh, my rough guess was 15,000 kilometers, I did that on the back of an envelope and I, I like to see that you guys do it very closely and found out that I was wrong. So. Uh, well, thank you for that. Councilor Columbus. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Shelley, it looks like it would be nine vehicles in total that would be required if we followed uh, your thoughts. Um, through the Mayor, uh, yes, Councilor Columbus, that is correct. Uh, when we consider bylaw officers and building inspectors, it would be nine vehicles under consideration. Now, some of these employees, they would use their personal vehicle right now go to a job site, look at it, whether it's a building inspector or a bylaw issue, and they would perhaps do it on their way home and drive directly home. Would they have to bring the car back into the headquarters here? And then that would cost some staff time, perhaps. How would, how would all that work, I guess? is Through, through the mayor. Um, uh, that is generally what happens with fleet vehicles currently. They are returned to the fleet site um, their location, prime location of work employment at the end of the day. Um, I'm looking to my colleagues, um, Mr. Baird and Mr. Enslin. That's currently the practice with any of the uh, vehicles that are assigned to employees right now. And I would assume that would continue if council so desires to move forward with this initiative. So perhaps that you'd have to offset some loss of work time to get the car back here. That's what I'm thinking. I know that's what happened with the provincial government when they had uh, the vehicle had to be back at headquarters and if you take it home you got to pay income tax on that use of that vehicle too thank you councilor van basen yes thank you madam mayor um i wasn't looking at this as as a recommendation that we just run out and purchase them i'm looking at more so as maybe there is ways to save money maybe it's a matter of pooling the cars like the the building inspectors for example that uh, certain days are days in the office with paperwork certain days are out in the field all day long um, rather than have them take their own vehicles, we have the, a couple of vehicles available, they sign them out, they take them for the day, the next day they'd be in the office, a different one, uh, same with bylaw, 
I, I'm looking at it more as that way. It's a, it's a little shift on how we're doing things, but at least we've got a base point to say, well, if we do have employees that are driving 20, 25,000 kilometers a year, it would actually be cheaper to provide them with a vehicle and other employees that, uh, you know, they're, they're, even if they're putting on 10,000, well, it's cheaper to reimburse them. But let's look at the bigger picture first, and, and then we'll deal with uh, whether we're going to be purchasing vehicles down the road in the capital budget. So. Councilor Robbins. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to our colleagues. Um, I think that it would be prudent to um, defer or send this uh, report to the Budget Committee. And upon further investigation, we could have a recommendation brought forward when we're doing our capital budget. I also believe that when we were looking at uh, fleet management, we were also considering leasing vehicles as opposed to purchasing them. So perhaps there could be an economy of scale if we were to lease as opposed to buy, uh, maybe not do the full nine. We've found the break-even point where we're spending more money on compensating mileage as opposed to uh, having our own vehicles for, for use, specifically, specifically for field work. So I think uh, it would be prudent for us to have that conversation at budget time as opposed to having it this evening. That's something that I would recommend uh, and something that I'd be willing to put forward in a motion if required. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. I think that's a great idea as well because I think the other part that we could look in, into this is we're not even talking about green vehicles, electrical vehicles at this point and what savings could be realized if we were purchasing electrical vehicles and what better vehicle to purchase than a Toyota. <laughs> so um, I think that there needs to be some further investigation as well there perhaps for, uh, for our green gurus inside Norfolk County. Councillor Van Passen. Okay, so let's finish. We'll receive it as information. Um, that's moved by Councillor Columbus already, seconded by Councillor Rabbits. All those in favor? That's carried. And then. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, I'm not sure if uh, Andy uh, caught uh, all of that content that was in there. Basically, we're just deferring uh, this report um, to the Budget Committee for uh, further review so they can bring something forward at, at budget time. And if you could wordsmith that um, and read it back to us, I'd, I'd be the one that would be moving that motion. Would it be prudent to send it back to staff at all to investigate the green vehicle portion of it to see what cost savings could be realized if we were purchasing an electric vehicle at this point so that that information could then go to the budget committee? I'd be amenable to that. Of course, I would like to look at, you know, leasing versus purchasing and I am open to other vehicles other than uh, a Toyota. Good branding for Norfolk, though. Come on. Three Mayor. Uh, so the report ECS 1920 be referred to the Budget Committee for further review and further considered during, and to be further considered during the budget deliberations, and that staff be directed to research uh, green alternative vehicles. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rabbits. I need a seconder, Councillor Martin. Any further discussion? All those in favor? And that's carried. Councilor Martin. Just a quick question that I would like to put uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Mr. Baird. Can you jog my memory on the, um, we discussed at budget, the green car charging ports and what, what's happening with that sure. for the next budget? Absolutely. Uh, through Mayor Chop, Councilor Martin, uh, last year, uh, Public Works staff put a proposal in the operating budget for um, a green vehicle with a couple of charging stations, one uh, at CAB, one at uh, the Delhi office. And the, the point there was fleet is within the public works realm, so we could do some testing and report on that. I think there's still uh, merit in doing that, and I, I really like what Councillor Rabbits has proposed here, purchase lease. If we know through this exercise that we, we probably could, there would be an economic advantage to having or providing vehicles to certain um, staff members that this might come through. So we have, again, put forward in the budget for your consideration, because I think it's worth uh, thinking about. You know, every year we get it gets stronger and stronger defense to, to look at that. Um, this exercise was really helpful to see how much driving you do. Uh, obviously, an electric vehicle, uh, if you're traveling 300 kilometers a day doing inspections or, or whatever, there's some uh, ideal staff members that uh, could take advantage of that. I think there'd be overall savings across the board. You'll see that at uh, the operating budget. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Chop and uh, members of council. This report, um, again, is one that you've seen in the past. Um, it actually outlines all the active capital projects and the status of each project. In addition, it, throughout the report, it suggests um, certain suggestions for projects to be cancelled or rebudgeted or closed. Um, in addition, if the project is completed over budget, staff have provided some suggested sources of uh, funding for the budget shortfalls. One area that we did um, look at, the report process that we went through and the information provided is similar, but um, last time at Council, um, there was you expressed some concern about the age of some of the projects. So financial services and all the project managers worked together and reviewed um, these older projects. And you'll find as a result of that, um, there are a number of projects that we have rebudgeted. And um, we're recommending right now 31 projects totaling um, just over $19.6 million be rebudgeted and included in the proposed 2020-29 capital plan. This will allow Council the opportunity to reevaluate and reprioritize projects based on more informed, up-to-date information and be more aligned with this Council's uh, strategic plan. Um, in, an, in addition, those we were recommending 31, but throughout your review, if there are any other projects that Council would like added to this list or feel they no um, longer um, feel we should go forward with it, we can definitely accommodate that to tonight through your review. Um, Thank you, Kathy. Uh, just one question for me. I mean, we, we have such a high number of outstanding projects. What is the number that's realistic in a year for us to be able to accomplish? Or maybe, Mr. Baird, that might be better to you. I don't know. Sorry, Mayor Chuck. Could you just repeat Yeah, that's that? okay. I just, it's such a high number, right, of outstanding projects that we have accumulated. So sure. as we look to what is realistic in a year for us, you know, moving forward in future years. That's an excellent uh, question. So a few, few comments on that. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, the complexity of the project changes. These are multi-year projects. I think of a water wastewater project. It's not just tendering for a truck, getting the bids and buying it. Um, we're seeing also uh, at the time of year when we issue tenders or contract uh, proposals, um, bidders might have a full season already in place. So their prices may be somewhat higher or quite a bit higher or there's a lack of bids because they already have a full, full plate for the year. Um, sometimes it has to do with the staff, our capacity to do, to do that uh, with a number of project managers. We, had, we only have two, we, we now have three, so we're able to get a bit more traction. And um, you know, those are probably some of the, bi the big ones. Um, so I think the prudent thing to do, as uh, Mr. LaPlante has said, is to we, you know, take a push back really reassess what can we do, can we truly get that done? And just because our plan says that we need, this is what we need to do, I think we need to be realistic because we all want these projects to proceed uh, to completion and within a reasonable uh, dollar value. There are occasions as well where perhaps our, our budget estimates may be overly lean and we haven't made provisions for other things that are unforeseen. So this is a bit of a correction, I think, for this year and your 2020 capital budget that you'll be reviewing in the near future, I think it's gonna be a bit more realistic and manageable. So again, this is a great exercise. So hopefully that gives a few thoughts. Uh, so we're kind of looking at doing really like realistically like 25 million a year or so based on. Correct, yeah, I think that's sustainable based on your staff complement and uh, the available contractors to actually do that work within our area. Okay, thank you, sir. Councilor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Baird, I'm particularly looking at number 280. Uh, with the additional 30 million anticipated, I'm wondering when we can expect that report, because that's, uh, that's quite a figure. Mayor Chalk, um, can I just ask Councillor for the, that figure again? I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Mayor Chop, and thank you, Council, for that. Um, yeah, so 
a lot of these projects have evolved. There's a number of things where the ministry has made additional demands or requirements for some of water wastewater systems. Um, some of this is development driven. Uh, so there's opportunities, although uh, that's a very high number, there's opportunities to fund that through development charges, uh, other infrastructure funding. It could be a project that we won't do unless we get one third funding or two thirds or however that might be. But I think it's really important just to say on, a, on the spectrum, here's the work that needs to be done if we're to meet such a, such objective, how we finance that is, is going to be up to uh, council with the advice of staff. So it is a big number, but uh, again, think of that, uh, drawn it over the future. Um, the ability to fund that, it's not like a, you know, a vehicle that we'll pay for in one year. Wastewater treatment plants or a recreation facility can be spread out over you know, 20, 30 years, if, if not further, so. We are looking at around 18 million for for Dover, and that was a big part of our meeting, um, with the joint meeting with Haldeman, to be able to secure uh, some funding from from the province and the federal government to be able to uh, develop um, that project because obviously we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do so on our own. Councilor, uh, sorry, many hands. Councilor Michelle and then Councilor Columbus, Councilor Van Pass, and I saw as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, through your, if I could ask a question of Mr. Baird. Um, Mr. Baird, I, I'm looking through this list of, um, of roads projects, and for some reason, I, I, I recall that we previously had County Road 23 on this list, but I don't see it here now. And I, I could be mistaken, but I, I believe we've had that project on this list for some time now, and I, I'm just curious why it's not on there now. <coughs> Um, through, through Mayor Chop, um, I'll consult with uh, Ms. LaPlante. It, uh, it may well be already in place, underway, or part of the plan. Some of these uh, uh, reflect the changes which are you know, being rebudgeted and so on. So we could double check that because it, we wouldn't just drop a project if certainly you're, you're well aware of it, that it's uh, scheduled. I'll look into it. Thank you. Councilor Columbus. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Whoever can answer this one, the, the mobile trailer speed signs and the speed watch signs that were passed by council on June the 18th, which department's looking after that and uh, where is that project at right now? Mayor Chaw, uh, Councilor Columbus, uh, there was funding through the Police Services Board and uh, the uh, purchase order was issued. It's through the roads department that that's being managed and uh, when we get that equipment, when it arrives, it would be deployed as uh, recommended in their reports. So uh, we would anticipate that at any point, I, I believe. Okay, thank okay. you. And the uh, secondly, the Cortland Water Tower, it says no longer required. And uh, I'm surprised to read that. Uh, why is that no longer required? I know Councillor Geisen has been questioning that for quite some time. So can you bring us up to date? Sure, absolutely, um, Mayor Chop. Uh, the Cortland Water Tower, this goes back a number of years, as you're aware. Uh, that was the plan to keep pressure and capacity up for, for uh, the community of Cortland. Cortland is serviced through the Delhi water system. We actually have a pipeline that goes from Delhi to Cortland. Um, one way to provide pressure and capacity is to put it up in the air like the water tower in Port Dover. Uh, but in Cortland, based on the size of it and expected growth, we're able to do that at ground level with uh, pumps. So it's far more economical and uh, less expensive. So that is the focus over the, the short to midterm. And uh, I, I know for a fact we've had considerably improved service to that community, not just for, for consumable water, but also for fire protection in those areas. Councilor Van Passen, I think I saw, and then South Councilor Huffman, and then Councilor Martin. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think this was a great exercise, but I, I know in the report it talks about some programs that we've canceled and eliminated and uh, rebudget them so we, we haven't really saved any money we just deferred it so uh, don't think that there's all of a sudden 20 something million dollars going to show up in some bank account that we can spend again but um, I think the, the important thing that comes out of this is we as a council have to make sure that we get the capital budget done early this fall and lock it in stone and not make adjustments when we get around to the operational budget so that our staff can get out and prepare tender documents, get them out early, get the best prices, and, and know what they're able to do and not do, and not have to wait until the entire process is done. So I don't know if we have to change some of the wording on some motions when we do the capital budget, but I know in 
from the history I've watched, uh, they approve a capital budget and then we need a few more savings on the tax levy, so we'll reduce some of the capital uh, budgets and later at a later date and we have to give them the confidence that they can go ahead and do their job and uh, get the best price and hopefully it'll work much smoother in the future. So. Okay, thank you, Councillor Van Basten. Councillor Hoppen. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Through you to um, Mr. Baird. Question. Um, looking at items 34 to 37 with the uh, pickup truck replacement, um, do we ever have any body work done on our county trucks? Um, through Mayor Chop, the, uh, the pickup trucks, we generally don't do body maintenance. The pickup trucks are designed to be replaced on a seven-year schedule. So with the exception of, you know, a really rough vehicle, we cycle, we, have, we start with the new ones more for patrol and, and so on, and the old dogs end up being used for cold patch or more heavier duty before they're disposed of. Um, it doesn't make sense, you know, if you start to keep a vehicle to the point where you're into body work, if it's not an accident, of course, um, you're probably keeping a fleet vehicle a bit too long. Okay. Uh, the, the, point, the point I guess I'm trying to make is that I was driving in downtown Simcoe a couple of weeks ago and a county pickup truck was, and it was really sad looking. It was really rusted out, like over the wheel wells and the doors and, and so, and I'm just thinking that doesn't bode well, I don't think, for the county. I, I get that we're trying to be cost effective, but it also doesn't look well, great for us when we've got, you know, vehicles that are all rusted out. So I was just wondering if we did have any kind of, you know, patchwork program. Not cold patch, but patchwork for vehicles. Um, I, I share your opinion too that, that our perception to our community is really important. Um, you probably saw one of the older uh, vehicles out there. Summer times are tough because we've got summer students and so it's all hands on deck. So any, any vehicle that still is operable sometimes is deployed. Um, our, our big replacement uh, from the time those tenders are issued, sometimes it's not like when you or I go to a, a new dealer and buy a vehicle and we get it a couple days later. Uh, when you're doing a fleet purchase where it could be anywhere from 7 to 15 vehicles, sometimes it takes more time. I know this year we, we got one pickup truck every two weeks and we've, you know, over the course of three or four months. So once the actual replacement comes in, so there are occasions where we do have those out there or perhaps our fleet is stretched to the limit. We do lease vehicles short term uh, th through the summer months, uh, mostly for our parks and rec, uh, the kids to do the grass cutting and, and different different programs. But um, that might have just been, you were in the right place at the wrong time, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point taken. Mayor, if I could follow up to that a little bit. That's one of the uh, issues with uh, the fleet review that was identified early on. When you start seeing uh, pickup trucks that they're rusting out while they're still mechanically sound, generally that's because they don't get washed very often. And when they're out on like winter patrols, they're driving through the slush and assault all the time. And it is something I've talked to staff about. Is it worthwhile to, uh, you know, have a separate bay and get them washed more often or, or even a drive just washing underneath them? To, if you can keep them from rusting, they're going to last longer. Is that a worthwhile? And again, it's going to be take some work on uh, here's the cost, here's the benefit, where's the balance? And uh, we are looking at that. But uh, there's, there's trucks out there you can put your feet through the floors. And uh, they don't have that many miles on them. They run great, but they just, uh, due to the, what the work they do, they don't last long. So. Council Clemens. Uh, Madam Mayor, to Mr. Fair, this very good report here and uh, a lot of detail in it that I think we should have. But reading through it, through the document, there's a lot of work that says it's going to be done in the summer and fall of 2019 tremendous amount of work and early start 2020 which is really good but have we got the human resource capability to complete all these projects there's through a Mayor, lot there yeah through Mayor Chop that we definitely struggled this year we had uh, uh, a late capital budget approval we had um, uh, a number of consultants that would generally bid on that for design work we have constructors that uh, in the case of, of one project that there's a memo in the information memo package um, that is on uh, Don John Boulevard that came in a million and a half over budget for no other reason than uh, any of the bidding contractors. We only had one bid 
uh, they're putting in excessively high bids, and if they get the job, they'll uh, accept penalties on others. Um, I think, again, this 20, 2019, think of it as a correction year. It was an opportunity for this council to get a good handle on the capital budget, for Kathy and her team uh, to, to go through these, get things tidied up once and for all. Um, from a staff perspective, I think now we have three project engineers in our engineering department. Uh, they're very capable people. Um, we have a couple of vacancies and, of course, our director of engineering that would lead that team. Uh, we're in a recruiting uh, process right now. Uh, so I think all of those things, I think we're going to all be pulling in the right direction for the 2020 year. A lot of these projects, we're going to be bidding them or, or tendering them, bidding them this fall and during the winter. So we'll have our program in place at least three, four, five months before we find ourselves in this year. Okay. And let's hope Mother Nature cooperates Correct. with us. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Through you to Mr. Baird, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon here, and it's a perfect segue. Uh, speaking about tendering number 55, Meisner Dam. I'm wondering if I can just give a bit of an update to the public on uh, narrowing down when it'll go out for tender. Uh, Mayor Chop, that's a great question. I know it's on everybody's mind, and certainly in the, uh, in the Port Dover area. Meisner Dam, uh, Council has made their direction. A tender, tenders will be reissued right after Labor Day, so we're a couple of weeks away. And we hope to secure uh, solid bids for the 2020 construction season. Um, most likely, those uh, prices will be back before um, the snow flies. And I'm hopeful that we have favorable bids. But uh, it's going to happen. It will. OK. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Any further comments? Okay, if I could have a, uh, I have a motion moved by Councillor Columbus, seconded by Councillor Rabbits, that report FS 19-24 regarding the June 30th, 2019 capital status report be received as information, and that the recommendations as set out in schedule included report FS 19-24 be approved, and further that staff review and update Norfolk County's capital program, budget preparation monitoring program. All those in favor? That's carried. Okay, the next report, uh, Heidi, I believe that's you, or Marlene, are you presenting? Or Heidi? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I skipped over one. Uh, staff report FS19-24, that's the operating variance uh, report. Thank you. Yeah, thank My you. last report for tonight. <laughs> so, um, this one report, Mayor, Count, uh, Mayor Chop and Council, we're very pleased to present tonight. This is something um, that has been on our list to get done, and um, you've requested it a number of times. Um, so before getting into any details or discussions about some of the information, I just want to talk a little bit about the development of the report. Um, financial services put the document together, but most definitely um, all the work was to meet this timeline and to get this information in, in a com comprehensive document was a result of a very large team collectively working and collaborating together. I believe that Bobby, we've made, there was over 30 meetings between financial services and managers, directors, financial services, CAO was involved. Um, it was really a, a team effort to pull this information together. Um, secondly, since we hadn't did one in very many years, we didn't have any developed processes or any reporting guidelines, et cetera, so it was all new to a, many, uh, to a lot of us, that uh, we thought it was going to be a very big huge roadblock for us, but it didn't end up because this team came together and realized that it was really important to get this job done and to provide council with some valuable information. Definitely we've learned uh, from the exercise and um, any of the items that we've learned, we'll be putting in some processes for the next uh, report. Um, any council feedback that we receive tonight and in the future, we'll definitely build that into our future variance reports. Just the appendices themselves that have been attached, I just wanted to um, outline that the actual documents, on page two of the report, we describe what's included in each column. However, I just want to point out that the total year and forecast, that's the column where all the um, work or the information is um, included. And that's where we've spent it, time determining do we have any unposted transactions, determining any outstanding purchase orders. Um, we did uh, numerous different uh, various analysis in the time frame that we had to, to help uh, come up with our estimates. And also in this document, you'll note that um, we have the division summary first, which includes all the departments rolled up into the division. And 
following the division summary, all the individual departments are outlined for you. So in case there was some confusion, but so some of the key drivers are um, repeated at the division level and they're also repeat, uh, they're also included in department level. And um, just for, on the other area that I wanted to note was uh, the plans for uh, reporting for 2000 and future years. It, uh, this report, we outlined it, some suggested plans, and I just want to note that that demonstrates that Norfolk County is committed and dedicated to provide ongoing, timely reporting to Council. Um, we know it's very meaningful. It'll help us in developing our budgets, and um, so definitely we'll be working on that. And the only, uh, uh, um, I just wanted to note that if we, if um, before this next, uh, I believe it's November, in November, we're going to plan to do a September 30th report. However, if there's a material difference that we do come across, we'll make sure that we report it to council and not wait till that reporting time period for you. Um, so, as in the actual forecast, we're forecasting right now for the levy budget a surplus of 174100 and for the rate, uh, 455300 I believe it is. And, uh, so we've indicated in the report the key drivers, uh, and again, I just, the, just want to stress that it is our forecast, and it, I'm sure it will change, um, but we are, all, we are definitely all working together to ensure that at the end of the year, we're striving for a surplus and that we do not end up in a deficit. We're going to work together as a team um, in departments, cross departments, to make sure, for example, the winter control, we... If we do have a bad season again, we're going to have to look for, see what we can do differently. And we're going to continue looking for some mitigating strategies so we don't end up in a deficit. But thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you for all of your work and that was put into this and your entire team. Um, just for council, so that sounds rosy right now that we're in a surplus position, but I had the opportunity to ask uh, Mr. Schlang over... Um, the AMO conference where kind of we should be sitting at this point in the year and uh, 174,000 actually sort of uh, scared him I think a little bit and he said we should be sitting closer to 500 well closer to a million um, in a surplus position um, the winter control operations obviously being one of the biggest factor uh, that you don't know where that's going uh, to go so just so council um, is aware that although it sounds good now, we still have uh, you know another six months to go from where that report was was sitting. Um, in terms of the winter operations, I just had one question. I, I'm a little bit. Was there a further reduction this year that I'm unaware of? No, this was just previous council's reductions in the winter operating budget. Uh, through the mayor, that's correct. We actually um, we did increase the budget from the prior year and then we reduced it slightly through SLT's uh, review looking at a five-year average but we are going to be looking at winter control in a different uh, light given that winter conditions continue to be, not get better <laughs> so um, we need to look at that differently um, for our budgets future budgets okay thank you and uh, Shelley I guess this question's for you um, in terms of the POA fines what are we doing on that end? And I know you had put together that excellent report with some options and so on. I'm just wondering what we're kind of doing to move forward with that. Mayor Chop, yes, um, as, as Kathy's noted in the report, uh, right now we're trending uh, less revenues than anticipated in the POA area. Um, generally speaking, charges are down and primarily in our part three area which have higher fines than the part one and part two uh, charges. We are working on a detailed report as we previously discussed to bring forward to council, talking about our collection strategies and sort of inf general information about the POA. Unfortunately, we did miss the September deadline uh, for the report. So the next reporting to council for us will be the council and committee in October. And that detailed report will come forward there. So we are continuing our collection efforts. We're working on uh, some information for council to have more fruitful discussion on collections. Okay, thank you, Shelley. And if I could keep going, uh, this one's for you <laughs> to go around the table. Um, Marlene, so one, we're seeing a gapping of over 1.1 uh, million in health and social services. Uh, the question applies to your department, but also kind of to all departments. So once we're seeing gapping, is there a timeline if we've been gapping for so long in a department where now that position comes back to council for review? 
Uh, so thank you, Mayor Chop. Um, not historically, we haven't brought gapping. We continue to try to recruit for those gap positions because um, they've been approved and clearly there's a need. Uh, there is work that's not being completed with some of this gapping. My gapping is significantly larger at this point in time because uh, Council will recall uh, there was some announcements back with the provincial budget. So we've actually been holding positions and gapping them and actually not providing um, certain activities over the last several months, awaiting our funding primarily in public health. Um, more recently at AMO, there was some announcements and as of Tuesday afternoon, I did finally receive the funding uh, for public health um, and that funding actually is at status quo. Um, so um, I actually have a meeting with finance tomorrow. We're gonna see what that looks like so we can ensure that with that funding envelope uh, through public health and there's been some changes with that funding that we can maximize the ministry dollars because we do not return money to the ministry um, and then try to keep um, as much of the levy um, to go towards um, any deficits or surpluses moving forward. So that's why you're seeing in, in uh, health and social services. Well, I'm just thinking of one of your senior, sort of more senior management yeah. positions in there that's been vacant for a really long time. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, and, and I know I, I commend you for actually yeah. not filling that position. Um, so I'm just wondering if at a certain <laughs> point in time though, again, not just your department, but all departments, if a position has sat vacant for a stretch and we are functioning, then perhaps it's an opportunity for that to come back. Maybe it's something at the budget time that we talk about that is an, a new policy that it comes back to council for, um, for review. The other piece was, I believe there was an audit done in the Health and Social Services yeah. Department a couple of years ago, correct? That identified a number yeah. of issues. Um, I'm just wondering with that sort of funding, if you think it may be time to consider sort of another audit. Um, so um, thank you, Mayor Chop. So a few things, I'll start with the director position that you're referring and that we have held um, with the announcements. We had already previously held it and reallocated those funds actually to do a community needs assessment, which was part of our um, Ontario public health standards requirements. So we've reallocated some of that funding towards that and held that position vacant. With the announcements back in April, we continue to hold that position. And as always, we're always looking at opportunities for efficiencies and restructuring. Um, um, so we're likely not going to be filling that position and we'll bring that back um, to uh, council. Um, recognizing that there are some activities and initiatives that haven't moved forward and um, just to actually walk right into that one uh, with the audit. Um, and I've been in discussions with the ministry staff actually. Um, we are still outstanding a couple of uh, recommendations and we still need to close the loop on that. They recognize that we don't have the capacity right now to do that. So we're working on a plan on how to minimize uh, what we need to do to comply um, with that because it does still need to be in full compliance so we can close the file on that health audit. That health audit was actually um, for the health unit only um, back into, it started in 2015 um, and actually it's not something that we did, it was the ministry um, and so um, that audit was um, by them and they have done several other audits uh, to other health units across the province. Um, so it's not something that would we would repeat, it would be something that would be uh, required of us as a public health if it was to happen again. My understanding is is that um, with these health audits that are occurring, that there could be revisits re uh, from the ministry and then we would have to uh, comply at that point in time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cridlin, um, park staff over time, could you maybe touch on that for us? Yes, the three mayor chop, the county council, I'll just turn to the page here. I think park um, wages are over, or just in my notes here, we're over somewhere around 187,000. Yes, that, that is correct. Um, I guess I'll start with parks have not had an increase in staffing members since uh, 2001 as far as, far as I know. Um, since then, uh, I'll look at uh, Ms. Darlington there, special events, I believe when we started, were probably 20 special events a year, I believe we're up to over 80. Park staff are, are very much involved in every one of these from garbage pickup to being on our property, uh, that sort of thing. So that is something we've had to, over the years, um, to make these festivals successful, um, have staff do. We've also, um, Councillor Michelle will be very familiar with the uh, beach accesses in Long Point, the amount of garbage calls we get. Uh, that was, uh, I believe in the past, an unbudgeted item and we have picked up uh, our garbage routine this year. I'm hoping the last four or five weeks have been better. We send uh, full-time staff or student out uh, sometimes twice a day to keep the garbage down. 
Um, cemeteries are another reason we've had uh, cemeteries come our way, most recently two rural ones, which we, we have to maintain. Uh, I also had a report on Panorama a few months ago, uh, and that, that uh, part of the reason we brought that report forward was we were, we were putting staff times towards this festival, and we needed to, I, I, at least I thought, let council know that we were and, and get the additional body for that. So um, with that $187,000, that's, that's how we arrive at that, just the, the amount of work that's been added and, and staff haven't been. And of course, festivals are, are great for our community. We get more and more all the time, and the beach access is it's just, just work that's been added and takes staff time, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm just wondering, like the way that I read that, if we were, I mean, 187,000 over at this point, that's when it's going to overtime and so on. It's kind of like the car situation where if it's a matter of needing another employee that now would be working for the whole year as opposed to on an overtime kind of basis, maybe that's... No, that, that's, you're 100% correct, Mayor Chop, and that's where... Um, I'm not sure of, of Ms. LaPlante's comments, but uh, it was an interesting, definitely, project to go through this forecasting, and this stood out at us as, 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 as an well. eye opener. Yes, because it, I think so. the calculation is something if we had stayed on track in that department, I think we'd have like 305000 somewhere around, something like that, with pretty, capping pretty, pretty dollars. Close to that, yeah. So, um, and then if I could just uh, one more in terms of the public work side of things, I know there was also direction from previous council. Um, for you, Mr. Baird, in terms of the GPS program, I think that would fall under yourself. I'm just wondering whatever happened to that program. I'm going to the Fritz, you're going to be off the hook, too. It's okay. <laughs> the GPS, also known as AVL, it was, uh, it was deferred. Uh, that didn't proceed. It was, in, there's, so there's a motion from previous council to defer that? Yeah. Is that? Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry. Any questions for councillors? Um, I do have a couple more then, if that's okay, just as I'm making some notes here. Um, in terms of the libraries, there is a huge deficit. I don't know who I would best direct this question to, actually, that's sitting here. Perhaps nobody can answer it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, I mean, they have a huge deficit, and I'm just wondering what happens sort of What's incumbent upon them with their budgeting as they come forward this year to, you know, try to reduce that deficit or? Through the mayor, uh, we haven't had any discussions yet with the Norfolk Public Library, and I believe I'm going to be attending a meeting on Wednesday to um, talk about the statement of operations. So that'll be a good opportunity. I had planned to actually maybe introduce what we just did here for um, for the county council here. Um, have them look at forecasting and promoting. Um, myself, unfortunately, um, I haven't been involved in the library to know that there has been a, a huge deficit. I didn't realize that um, at this point in time. Um, what we were looking at is our requisition for, for their levy and it affects their, their, the library reserve. So if they do go into a deficit, uh, there's no funds put in the reserve and it's taken out of the reserve. So um, we'll definitely work with them to see again if there's anything, mitigate, any mitigating strategies they can work on or we could look at or if there's anything that we can do to help them. Um, as far as the process or the obligation, I, I'd have to look into that. Okay. How, the, how it actually works with the library board. I'm not familiar working with the library board, so but okay. we'll look into it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, just again, so we're not thinking that this 174,000 is all a good news story. We saved, I think, 345,000 in debenture payments for capital projects that didn't move forward. So um, although we're saving in debenture payments, it of course costs more to build later than it does now. So. Um, you know, that's also wrapped into the numbers that we're seeing, and just so we're acutely aware of that. Uh, so, um, any further questions for anyone? Councilor Van Passen. Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, a great exercise, and we're, we do have a pro projected uh, surplus. I just would like to ask uh, Mr. Baird, what does one good snowstorm cost us? About fifty, seventy-five thousand bucks. Uh, it's closer to a hundred thousand. Yeah, we're one storm away from two storms, and we got a deficit. I agree. Uh, okay, so in that case, um, thank you again.
this was awesome and I look forward to the next one. And I think this is a huge step forward for Norfolk County right now. So uh, I can't thank your entire team enough for that. Um, motion moved by Councillor Van Pass and seconded by Councillor Huffman that uh, report FS 19-29 June 30th, 2019 operating budget variance report be received as information and that staff be directed to monitor the 2019 operating budgets and take any reasonable steps to reduce or eliminate negative variances while mitigating any negative impact on service levels. And further, that staff review and update Norfolk County's month-end cutoffs and budget variance reporting policy. All those in favor? And that's carried. And just as the side note, that comment maybe at senior leadership of starting to think about these positions that you know have been gapped for some significant period of time that have been left vacant maybe we need to start considering a policy on uh, after a position's been vacant so for so long when it comes back to council in the future but we can look at that another day okay next one is uh now it's over to you Heidi for staff report HSS 19-32 the chippy uh, investment plan Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to members of council, this is an annual report that we bring forward to council to outline the funding allocations for the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative, what we also like to call the CHIPI. This is 100% funding that comes from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for the purpose of homeless prevention programming. Um, we did have some communication at the end of the day yesterday from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing that does affect these allocations. Um, the ministry has announced that they are pausing the homeless enumeration project for 2020. So we are not required to undertake that work for 2020. So therefore the additional 5% administration money that we have allocated for that purpose is no longer required. So if I could just ask council to turn to page four of the report where the finance comments are, there is a chart there and um, I, I will walk you through what the amended allocations are. So under the CHIPI guidelines, our, our administration allocation, if, if we are not doing enumeration, is 10%. So the administration allocation is amended to $148,950. So that is actually a decrease in administration spending from, 20, from last year, or from the budget, uh, to, of $59,150. Sorry, Heidi, to interrupt. Was there, could you track me where exactly is this? Uh, Madam Mayor, it's on page four of six of the report under financial services comments. It's a page 130 of your agenda. Okay, I'm looking at 130. Uh, that was where I was. I'm just not seeing the... Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. So we're, we're under uh, financial services comments table number one that outlines the budget amendments. Mm -hmm. um, so under administration, the amended 2019 budgeted amount for administration is $148,950. Okay, so what I have on my paper, unless I'm wrong, under administration we have the approved budget was 208000 and it just went up to 223000 That's correct, Madam Mayor. That is what was initially um, put into the report uh, because we were going to be keeping 15%. The additional 5% was for the enumeration project. At the end of the day yesterday, we, that's the ministry communication that we received. So we're reducing that administration by that additional 5%. My apologies, thank you. That's... Uh, no problem, it's, it's, it was a last minute change and my apologies to councils for that. Um, so the new amended 2019 budget amount for program administration is $148,950. So the difference between the approved 2019 budget and the amended 19 budget for admin is a decrease in admin of $59,150. Going to the next line of that chart under emergency shelter solutions, there is no change. Housing with related supports, there is no change. Homeless prevention, the 
this, the reduction in admin, we are going to add to the homeless prevention budget line for increased funding in the Housing Stabilization Bank. So the amended 2019 budget is now 296,400. So that's a difference of 89,250. And under other supports and services, there is no change. So that still leaves our total CHIPI funding allocation for 2019 at the frozen levels of last year of 1,489,500. Under emergency shelter solutions, we operate 25 uh, emergency housing beds for people who are homeless across the two counties with um, service providers. Under housing with related supports, we operate the domiciliary hostel program, which is supported housing. Um, we had one of our former, or one of our current domiciliary hostel providers from Simcoe Residential, you may recall, who appeared as a deputation uh, a little bit, a uh, little while back. Housing with related supports is also where um, we provide operating support to uh, the residents, to Indwell for the residents of Hamilton Hall. Under homelessness prevention, um, that is where we provide um, assistance um, for last month's rent, rent arrears, and utility arrears through our housing stability bank. We also provide uh, assistance for um, extreme cleanup for people who are facing eviction due to hoarding. And we have a small amount of money for emergency home repairs for low-income homeowners who need those, those types of repairs to stay in their home. And finally, under supports and services, those are the salaries and benefits amount for our four frontline program staff who directly deliver the programming. So that's one intake worker and three housing support workers. So with that, Madam Mayor, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, okay, thank you, Heidi. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to request that uh, an explanation memo is drafted with an updated chart to be posted online just so the public can stay aware of that. Madam Mayor, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. So when you add the uh, administration and the other supports and services, the benefits program, we're sitting almost at 500,000 of 1.6, 1.5 million. So we're around that 33% mark. Is that about correct then? Administration-wise, we're about 33%? Okay. Um, Madam Mayor, through you to Council, under the, if we look at the, all of the staffing costs, that would be correct. The, pro, the funding guidelines for the CHIPI differentiate between um, staff who oversee the programs um, as administration and those related costs, and staff who provide direct service to clients are considered as program staff and they are not considered part of the administration budget. Um, if I could, just another question. So over the last little bit, I've been trying to learn more about the buckets of housing money that we have. And I see here written on page 127, so CHIPI is to be used to provide services to people who are experiencing homelessness, are at risk of homelessness, and homelessness prevention supports and services in Haldeman and Norfolk. Of the CHIPI money that we receive, 160,000 of that is committed to Hamilton Hall um, for Indwell, correct? That's correct. So then the Ontario government came out with a new program, which was the continuation of investment in affordable housing for Ontario that ended, uh, that's coming to an end, and they came up with the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative, correct? Right. So that program uh, says that it is intended to provide flexible funding to all 47 service managers to address local priorities in the areas of housing supply and affordability, including new affordable rental housing construction, community housing repair, rental assistant, tenant supports, and affordable home ownership. So I guess just my question to you is, if CHIPI is being used to fund, is being directed specifically to fund homelessness and we're using that to pay Hamilton Hall 160,000 for Inwell but Inwell now is falling under a different bucket that doesn't actually mention homelessness at all in its priorities from the government 
just wondering how we reconcile the two places are provide unless they're providing different services i don't think they are right they're providing the same services M madam mayor you're correct they're providing the same services um the difference is that we're um one is a capital bucket and one is an operating bucket. So when Hamilton Hall was constructed, um, Indwell did receive capital funding from the previous affordable housing program called the Investment in Affordable Housing Program for that capital. And then they receive operating through the CHIPI. In the next report we are going to talk about uh, Council will see that under the Ontario Priority Housing Initiative, staff are recommending that the first year of the Norfolk Inn grant be paid out of the capital bucket um, for in the amount of $250,000. So we are able to um, what's called stack from uh, our capital and from our operating funding in order to be able to move projects forward. And in, in our community, because we are smaller in nature and we don't get the multi-million dollar allocations that some of the larger centers do, we often have to do that in order to, to be able to move larger projects forward and make a real impact. Okay, but we also have projects um, with, in terms of housing supply and affordability under the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative that we also need to move forward. So I just, for myself, whether it's capital or operating, I mean, I think Hamilton Hall had three million up front in capital? At two million. Two million, okay. So Hamilton Hall had two million up front in capital plus 160,000 a year. And we are directly, we're running that operating out of, uh, out of Chippy. But the way that Hamilton Hall was presented to council, it was very much an operating budget that was presented to council, not a capital budget. They weren't asking us for a contribution to capital. They, in terms of we were willing to waive development fees and all those kinds of things. Um, but it was, it was certainly an operating budget that was prevented, presented. So that's why I'm just struggling now to determine how two projects that don't have remotely the same language are being able to use to fund two different projects but that's just more of an observation as I struggle to learn these buckets of funding any other questions from counselors okay, okay so um, motion uh, has been moved by Councillor Michelli and seconded by Councillor Huffman that uh, staff report HSS 19-32 2019 to 2020 Chippy investment plan be received as information and that council accept the community homelessness prevention initiative funding allocation for the 2019 2020 fiscal year from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing in the amount of one point uh, a million one million four hundred ninety nine thousand five hundred and that council approve the per program allocations for the CHIPI 2019-2020 fiscal year as outlined in the staff report. And that staff be directed to communicate the allocations to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing through the submission of the CHIPI investment plan. And further that the approved 2019 levy supported operating budget be amended accordingly. If I could just ask one final question. The amendment to the, the levy was, did I miss that? So, Madam Mayor, um, they're, they're, the reason why we are amending the budget is because at the time of the budget um, preparation for 2019, we believed that the CHIPI allocation was going to be um, a higher amount. We believed that it was going to be the $1.6 million. And then after the budget was approved, we learned that our, our funding was frozen at last year's level. So we have had to adjust our per program spending accordingly in order to stay within our 100% funding envelope. Okay, so, so originally on the operating budget, we had 1.644 uh, million, but million 644,800. Now we're only receiving 1,489,500 and we're proposing to charge that difference of 1 million or 155,000 300 to the taxpayers? 
no, Madam Mayor, we have made adjustments within the, the spending in order to stay within the funding envelope. So the budget is being amended in, uh, as per finance comments, um, and the total of the revised allocations is the 1.489 million. So the, the operating budget will, sh will be amended to show expenditures in the amount of 1.489 million, and then offsetting revenues from the province in the amount of 1.489 million for a levy impact of zero. Okay, my apologies. I thought when I heard earlier you had some, one of the savings from the administration bucket, you were gonna also move down into homelessness prevention. We are, but that is, that's still um, within the provincial envelope. We're netting out at zero that's on the correct. operating levy. That's correct, yes, Perfect. we are. Just checking. Okay, do I have a move, uh, Councillor Michelli and seconded by Councillor Hoffman. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. And the next report, I believe, is yourself as well? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, as you mentioned, um, we have two new programs in affordable housing that have been announced. Um, the first one is called the Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative. And the purpose of, of that pro program is to reinvest funding into um, previously federally funded social housing programs. So in Haldeman and Norfolk, we have four housing providers who were funded under this program. Six or seven years ago, we, uh, the Council of the Day um, approved a budget amendment to uh, change the funding formula for two of them so that we could keep them in the program. Because the way that program works is that when the mortgages are paid off, they can leave the program and no longer be social housing providers. The, um, the next um, provider that has a mortgage that's coming due within the next year is eligible for our Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative funding in the amount of just over 17,000 that we have allocated. So we are in discussions with them about uh, a capital project um, that they could undertake um, in exchange for remaining as a social housing provider. So the purpose of the what's called the COCHI funding is to negotiate with those existing social housing providers who were funded under an old federal program that's coming to an end so that we don't lose that housing stock, that social housing stock in the community. Um, the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative Fund, or what's being called OFI, is the new program that um, has replaced the investment in affordable housing program. So at the last council meeting, we talked about the different affordable housing programs that have been in, in place over the last 10 or so years. The uh, affordable housing program, the investment in affordable housing program, the extension, the social infrastructure fund. Now it's the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative. So we have um, just over uh, 700,000, um, just over 750,000 in that uh, funding for this year. We are proposing uh, 250,000 of that towards the first year of the Norfolk Inn funding. Um, the balance of the funding, we are, there's 250,000 for the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation for capital projects under the Ontario Renovates program. We have $60,000 for housing allowances with our three community living partners in Haldeman and Norfolk who support people uh, li living with developmental disabilities. Excuse me. Um, and then um, we also have uh, some funding for um, a, a new partnership for supports of our existing social housing tenants in the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation um, for them to have a dedicated housing stability bank to assist their tenants who are uh, potentially facing eviction um, due to rent arrears. 
So um, we are requesting council um, approval of this investment plan and then we will, um, once approval is received, we will uh, submit that to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and then move forward with the uh, contribution agreements under this program. Um, this funding is 50% provincial funding and 50% um, federal funding and there is no levy requirement for this and all of our spending is uh, remaining within the funding envelope. Council Martin. Thank you, Mayor Chop. Through you to Heidi. Are you taking the um, remaining funds in, in full for the Housing Stability Bank for potential arrears evictions? You just didn't state how much would be allocated for that particular um, so new program you mentioned. But through you, Madam Mayor, that is under the supports and services. We can keep up to 5%. And we are proposing that um, we use $36,635 for that. And the investment plan has been developed in consultation, um, those allocations with the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation, and they're, they're very supportive of, of, of that plan. Um, <clears throat> any further comments, Columbus? Yes, uh Heidi, you mentioned the housing corporation is getting $250,000 here, but there's been a project on the books at the housing corporation, Regent Street, I believe it is, in Port Dover, where they want to expand housing opportunities for seniors and those in need in that Port Dover area where there's more seniors coming on. And uh, when are, are you working closely with the housing corporation to make that happen? I guess that's the key. Perhaps Councilor Rabbit knows more about it, but... I know I sat on the housing board for eight years, the housing corporation, and they came up at every meeting is with that project, and I haven't heard anything lately. Can you bring us up to date on your cooperative efforts? Certainly, Madam Mayor, through you to Council, I can start, and then I would also invite Councillor Rabbits to fill in any gaps that I provide. Um, I have met with Mr. Matt Bowen on multiple occasions, the new CEO of the Housing Corporation. Um, I, I am very much looking forward to working with Matt. I think he um, is a very strategic thinker and leader and um, he has a great vision for affordable housing for this community that that I and my team share and um, we have we are currently working on um, a couple of different collaborative projects um, and also we have been moving forward with finalizing the shareholders agreement that's that's going to be coming to uh, a joint meeting of the shareholders um, tentatively in October. Uh, and that will be the shareholders' opportunity to, to give the housing corporation a future mandate that can include affordable housing development. Uh, Mr. Bowen and I have had conversations about the potential of the Port Dover um, development, and, and I know that there are some um, servicing capacity issues there. Um, but regardless of the future of that specific project, uh, he and I definitely share um, the, the idea that there is room for the housing corporation to be um, a, an affordable housing provider as well as a, a traditional social housing provider. Can, can I just I'm really pleased to hear that because we hear every week that there's money coming down the pipe from the feds and the province. So glad to hear that something's happening. So, Madam Mayor, through you to Councillor Columbus, if I, if I might, one of the things that um, Mr. Bowen and I are doing are arranging a meeting with our um, advisor at Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation about the National Co-Investment Fund and, and what, what funds the Housing Corporation might access. Does Haldeman also receive OV money, or is it just us and it's split between? So, Madam Mayor, through, through you to Council, the... Uh, all of the housing funding comes to Norfolk as the Consolidated Municipal Services Manager. And then uh, through the advisory committee, um, staff suggests recommendations to council. And we are always very careful to make sure that we are sharing uh, the pot of money appropriately in all of the funding streams. 
So arguably, if this was Haldeman, I would be saying you guys took 250000 for the Norfolk and we want the 250000 over in Haldeman. Is that not the way that would kind of work? So, Madam Mayor, um, through you to Council, um, our last big affordable housing project that received a $2 million capital contribution is in Dunville and um, it's currently under construction, almost finished. So we try to go back and forth between Norfolk and Haldimand. So we had Hamilton Hall that received a $2 million capital contribution, and then we had Aspen Apartments in Dunville. And so now um, it, it, in staff's uh, recommendation, we believe that it would be appropriate to look at a capital project in Norfolk, specifically the Norfolk Inn. Hopefully, Mayor Hewitt's not watching right now. <laughs> Councillor Pappas. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, uh, the only thing that I would like to add is uh, the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation is currently undergoing a strategic plan review. This is going to be engaging with board members. Uh, Councillor Corbett of Haldeman and myself are part of the strategic planning process. We're going to be having this plan finalized prior to the shareholders meeting coming up in October. Uh, so it's an opportunity for us all to present our vision for housing in our communities at that time. Uh, obviously, regeneration projects are going to be a topic of conversation, not only uh, the project that we were earmarking for Port Dover on Region Avenue, but there are other opportunities for regeneration. And I'm a little hesitant to um, comment on which project may take precedence over another prior to having that strategic planning process uh, come through to fruition. So we may set different strategic uh, priorities. Uh, Region Avenue is definitely going to be high on that list, uh, but there are other properties that are managed by that housing corporation. And we're going to meet as a group to sort of set our strategic plan for where we feel our priorities lie in terms of regeneration projects. One thing I also would like to mention is that the housing corporation, of which we are shareholders, uh, these are assets that we do own. We have well over $12 million of unmet capital needs. So in this um, report, we have $250,000 going towards those unmet capital needs. It is a drop in the bucket, but it's going to allow us to um, do some preventative maintenance and maintain uh, many of our assets and not let them fall into disrepair. Uh, and lose those assets at the end of the day is what happens if you were to let a building go too far. Um, you begin to have envelope issues and other issues. Uh, you could potentially have a fire. There's health and safety concerns uh, when you're not engaging in those preventative maintenance activities. So this is a very good step in the right direction in starting to meet some of those unmet capital needs in addition to um, the allocation that will be going towards the Inwell project here in Simcoe. So that's, that's some of the uh, irons that are in the fire, so to speak, and some of the good things that we have to look forward to. I think that we're going to have a real opportunity to nail down um, as a primary shareholder and in partnership with Haldeman County what councils collectively uh, ambitions are at that shareholders meeting in October. So allow your housing corporation to go through a strategic planning process. We have a new CEO in place. And I believe that there's going to be more information coming forward in the near future. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Chop. I pose this question either to my colleague or to um, Heidi. That Councillor Columbus's question is a great question that's been on my radar to connect with as well. Um, since being elected, this information about the Regent Street project has never formally come to Council in any way, yet I do hear about it and I am asked about it regularly and I never have a concrete um, answer. So I guess my questions very informally would be if I would, it were able to articulate some things back to the people who asked me, um, you know, without capacity issues, is this something that we would expect to go on a capital, capital budget? Like, are we looking at... Um, giving consideration to these projects and formulating them uh, in the next, you know, 10 years? Or are they much farther down the road? Because I truthfully have not been able to uh, share any helpful information with the public on it. So thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, through you to Councilor Martin. Um, the, the first thing that needs to happen is that the shareholders need to give some direction through the shareholders agreement to the housing corporation about what their future mandate is going to be. Uh, right now, it is restricted to the traditional rent geared to income social housing. At the joint shareholders meeting, through the, the presentation of the shareholders agreement, um, 
uh, Mr. Bowen and I will be facilitating a discussion with the shareholders about the possibility of expanding that mandate to include affordable housing development. Uh, once we have a shareholders agreement in place, then we would start to look at uh, individual business plans of projects to see if um, they meet the requirements under the Housing Services Act around um, tenant engagement and tenant relocation so that existing any existing tenants are not displaced, that sort of thing. Um, if, if there's a plan to sell any existing stock in order to provide a funding source, um, we have to look at all those business plans and, and what any risk or liability to the shareholders would be and um, present a recommendation to the shareholders on that individual business plan for consideration. So I, I would suggest that um, after the shareholders meeting in October and we've given direction to the housing corporation about about a future mandate, um, then we'll be in, in a better position to start looking at at the merits of individual plans. Thank you. Okay, um, I just, one more question that I have is in terms of the administrative costs for this. So, and I just um, want to understand that I'm understanding where all of the money of the 750,000 is going. So 250,000 is going to the Norfolk Inn. 250,000 is going to the Housing Corp. 60,000 is going to the, uh, the community like NACL and, and those organizations. And then the new one then is the housing support services. That's correct, Madam Mayor. Okay, 36 and am I, what else am I missing then? Madam Mayor, we, if I might, we are able to keep 5% um, towards um, uh, our administration costs in order to, to bring down um, our, our existing uh, overall program admin. Um, we use existing staff within the Housing Services Department to deliver these programs. I'm just, I guess, I don't know how everybody else, I'm just wondering, 37000 almost for administrative costs when Norfolk in we're cutting a check, the Housing Corp, we're cutting a check, NACL, we're cutting a check. Just don't understand where, when we desperately need affordable housing in Norfolk County, how we're kind of justifying 37000 in administrative costs to cut a couple checks. So Madam Mayor, through you to Council, um, when we prepare our overall budget for housing services, our housing services department not only delivers these programs, but they manage the centralized wait list for social housing, and they deliver uh, any of our legacy social housing programs that are funded coming to an end under our previous affordable housing funding, and they work with all of our existing social housing providers. All of that work together um, is delivered by um, uh, two housing resource coordinators, um, an administrative finance clerk, and a program manager. And so we maximize our uh, admin allocations in our all of the provincial funding buckets that we get across the department in order to minimize the levy requirement for these programs for in the area of program administration. Thank you. Um, and then just one final comment is in terms of all the other buckets that we have. So the housing allowance, home ownership, Ontario renovates, um, and so on and so forth. And today I've heard, you know, we're talking about seniors, um, people with disabilities, administrative costs. I'm just not hearing a lot with the affordable housing, which is what we desperately need um, if companies like Toyotetsu are going to be able to fill positions and I think that we at some point have to start these are all valid important areas that we need to look at but when money is being directed from the government for affordable housing I think we need to start putting up some more attention on affordable housing any further comments okay so uh, I have a motion then moved by Councillor Huffman seconded by Councillor Michelli that staff report HSS 19-35, Provincial Allocation of Ontario Housing Priorities, Housing Initiative in Canada, Ontario Community Housing Initiative Funding and Investment Plan 2019-2020 to be received as information. 
and that Council accepts the allocations for the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative in Canada, Ontario Community Housing Initiative funds as detailed in the Service Manager Transfer Payment Agreements to be signed by the Mayor and Clerk, and that Council approve the Haldeman Norfolk Investment Plan as summarized in Staff Report HSS 19-35 to be included as Schedule H in each service manager's transfer payment agreement, and that the approved 2019 levy-supported operating budget be amended to include 732700 for the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative and 17300 for the Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative, as outlined in the staff report, funded by the federal and provincial governments. And further, that staff be directed to forward the service manager transfer payment agreement as signed by the mayor and clerk along with the program investment plan to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. All those in favor? And that's carried. Look at us moving right along. Mr. Cridlin, did you want us to jump back to your um, the, the lights and sirens baseball tournament? Uh, thank you, Mayor Chop. Um, let's I'm going to suggest that, uh, and I've talked to uh, Constable um, Bullard about this, the event has already been held. He does not know his final bill yet. Um, the Wendell Park, I should have caught on to this, but a, a learning moment for myself, and I'll pass on to Council, that Wendell Park is, is a, um, a private group that does our booking for us. It's do not done through facilities booking. So I, I don't think there's any um, hurry on this, and he's quite comfortable with... Um, getting the exact number and bringing it back to the first meeting in September. He did also throw out historically it's been about $300 because it is uh, $20 per diamond per game. It'll, it, it'll de it depending on how many games they had, that sort of thing. So if council is okay with that, I think that's the best step here. And he's, he's quite comfortable with that as well to bring this back to the September 3rd or 4th meeting, I believe. Perfect. And I'll have the exact thing and council can deal with it then. I think um, it's probably the first meeting is the public meeting, so I would say it would be the following week at the council and committee yeah. meeting. Uh, yeah. The first meeting is the... Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we'll have it for the CIC meeting anyways. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Um, Councillor Van Passen. That was what we jumped back to, yeah. Thank you, Van Mayor. Um, we have a policy in place for this. We talk about it. We can't do these little one-offs all the time so that we can give a donation to a charity who's going to give it to a charity. We could just cut out the middleman and find out what charity is, cut the check straight to the next one. But, you know, what difference does it make? There's a process in place. Don't waste our time on all these little one-off things. We amended the policy so we don't have to waste our time with little one-off things. And... If you start giving it to one, the next one will be here, the next one will be here, and the next one will be here. So, and again, it says they are asking for a donation so that they, they can give it to a charity. Why have the middleman? I agree as well. I mean, there's so many value, like valid causes that come forward asking. There's been some other people right in the meantime um, that have requested funding. I've even seen letters, but I just, I, just, I thought that we had a new policy that it was going to be at the time that the grant applications came in. And while they, these groups didn't know it for this year, what we directed the clerk, I distinctly recall, was that he was to communicate to any groups that came forward with these requests. He would inform them that this is our new policy, and for next year, these are the dates by which you need to apply. I thought that was what we had decided, was it not? That was, I think, your suggestion, Mr. Schlang, because you said we can't keep having all these little items keep coming forward to council meetings all the time. Uh, three, Mayor. Um, so, yet yeah, the grant, um, there, there is a grant policy, and it is established. So, if council desires, uh, with every one of these that I just simply um, send on to that established process, uh, uh, that is n not a problem. The only change that we made to the procedural bylaw uh, is with in respect to deputations. So if council um, doesn't want them presented here, that, that's not a problem. That'll be a direction I'll, I'll take moving forward. Like I just, I really remember the council meeting where it wasn't just deputations. It was specifically that we didn't want to keep having them come forward in our agenda and that we were cutting that out and it would be a once a year process. So with that, um, did we want to take, okay, so you had a motion on the floor, I believe Councillor Hoffman to approve uh, the donation.
Did do you? Oh, do you I'll pull ask? the motion. Okay. So we've received it as information in that case, and um, hopefully you could just let them know how they can apply next year for the grant program and so on. And and it's just perfect. This might be our second fastest council meeting of all time. Look at us moving right along. <laughs> Uh, okay, so moving on to bylaws. Uh, motion moved by Councillor Van Passen and seconded by Councillor Huffman that bylaw 2019 84, bylaws 2019 85, and bylaw, or sorry, bylaw 2019 86 and 2019 88 be approved by the mayor and clerk and affixed with the corporate CLIC. Uh, Councillor Martin's hand. I maybe should have pulled this separately earlier. Bylaw 2019 86. I have a question for Mr. Cridlin. Okay, so let's, should we remove that? We'll remove bylaw 2019 86 and we'll handle that in a minute. We'll approve Wonderful. the other two. Does that work? Okay, so now it's 84 and 85 and 88. And 88 is where? Okay, okay. No, that's Kathy, okay. All those in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Uh, Councillor Martin, coming back to 86. I'm skimming the bylaw here. Maybe I'll just pose this to Mr. Cridlin. Details surrounding traffic flow, St. George Street, St. Andrew Street. In this bylaw? road closures and tents. I guess if I can help Councillor Martin out in our conversation that we had with you yesterday on the, the drive home um, I think you're getting at the two-way yeah but I traffic it's in this bylaw so yes I am mayor chop is is that I don't even see it in there either um, through you mayor uh, the uh, traffic bylaw, I think, went at the last meeting in June, or the or the first uh, council in July. Well, there was only one council in July, so uh, th this is kind of a, a separate bylaw um, because um, we realized, because uh, of a late submission from a community group down there, that there was no exemptions to allow for things like camping or noise bylaw exemption for this year's event. So this is kind of the, our our attempt to get those types of uh, exemptions to council policies in place for for the community organization okay so if I may uh, before passing this bylaw I just would like to confirm with mr. Cridlin that the conversation yesterday pertaining to scouts and whatnot is a will be taken care of if we pass this bylaw as it reads or would you like me to change something yes. in it? Through, through mayor chop um, I'll, I'll look at the clerk to be sure I'm, I'm right but the, the email we had, we are okay to, to vary from these times on the Kinsman property only. Is that correct, correct, Andy? Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, all that we require is permission of the property owner, yeah. and, and Mr. Cridlin's the property owner. Yeah, which been supplied. Wow. Or, yeah. or council, whatever you so <laughs> desire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay. To my colleagues, we're talking about uh, the scouts serving food on Norfolk County property and the Kinsman selling apparel when the campers show up. Um, and Mr. Cridlin and Mr. Grizel handled that for us, so thank you. I guess maybe when this is finished, I'll, I'd like to revisit that traffic conversation. Um, okay, so a uh, motion then to approve bylaw um, 86. That'll be moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? That's carried. And um, <clears throat> now moving on. To, uh, there's no motions this evening. I'm wondering, so the first meeting is September the 3rd. We wouldn't have a council meeting in time, so if you wanted to make a new motion for the traffic, I think you would probably have to get, waive the rules of order and have it heard this evening, but perhaps you want to provide some background and Mr. Gridland could maybe provide some comments. Thank you, Mayor Chop. I would. Uh, to my colleagues, the Friday the 13th changes that council and staff have suggested and supported to implement 
have um, been more than, uh, haven't been accepted well in the community, and that's an understatement. That being said, I wholeheartedly um, stick to the commitment we made to our staff and to public safety uh, with the changes in mind that we've suggested, with the exception of the direction to staff to have two-way traffic on both St. Andrew Street and St. George Street. Every year, Friday the 13th, as is July 1st, it is one-way traffic up and back down the other way. Uh, the community has a lot of concerns about this. They don't think that it's going to mitigate um, a lot of the risk factors. Business owners are extremely concerned about it as well. Uh, so I would suggest that the um, changes we made are, are done incrementally. We want to keep the public happy, um, and I'm not looking to revisit some of the big changes that we've talked about with, uh, with our EMS team and the police. I would like to um, make that amendment to the bylaw and suggest that the traffic on St. Andrew and St. George, either side of Main Street, go back to one way traffic only as they have been for every other year and uh, when staff look at the details of the changes we've made I would like um, those details too to be brought back to council to see if this is something that we should revisit again later or not but I would like to tell the community that we hear some of their um, concerns and that we have listened thank you so just further to Councillor Martin's point again I mean it's not looking at changing you know Main Street and the decisions that we've made but at least let them know that we're like she said hearing some of the concerns that they're bringing forward in Port Dover and speaking with yourself yesterday Mr. Cridlin you made it sound like this was something that might be possible to 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 do through, through the mayor my comments when I when I did have a discussion with the ward councillor on this were um a lot of the changes we made this year have been in the planning process for months now and are fine-tuned. A lot of these um, we wouldn't want, we, we couldn't quite frankly change. Uh, as far as I've talked to a few staff this morning, as far as going back to the one-way traffic, um, staff worked as a team with fire, EMS, police. We've put on a lot of these events. The, the one-way traffic seemed to have, it did have some faults at certain times. We had people traveling two ways on a one-way street. Uh, so we had thought if you made them two-way streets, that would take care of that. If council does wish to, to go back and change that in the bylaw, it is one thing that we can accomplish in the short time before the event. So that was my comments, that that, that is doable if council decides to, to do it. Councillor Martin, maybe I just, I mean, you know better than all of us, and, and I've only been to a couple Friday the 13th myself, but perhaps you could describe with the, the narrow, with the road, what you explained to me with the bike parking and then how narrow the street is now beside it for the two-way traffic and so on. Certainly. So the um, side roads are used as bike parking, and, and this council decided that they would stay as such. So bikes will be parked on either side of both St. Andrew Street and St. George Street, um, running the same direction as Main Street. So that it, uh, creates a little bit of a narrow space anyways. Then the additional proposed changes would allow that narrow space to have traffic flow in both directions. Previous years, that traffic flow has only gone in one direction. Bikes tend to drive in packs with each other, two or three wide. Um, so there's reduced space anyways, and then we would be driving the traffic in both ways. Um, so I just, yeah, I would like to advocate that we, for at least this year, it is a peak season event. It is still very busy for us, and the community members aren't aren't loving the concept. This is what we do on July 1st with cars on either side of the road. They turn into one-way um, traffic flow. So, yeah, they're just, they're just narrow, and business owners have concerns about them. And The other piece that you mentioned as well to me with that was that, of course, since we're not doing, you know, the bike parking in that initial section of Main Street where people like to walk, I mean, that's part of the... I mean, the big draw for Friday the 13th, people want to go and check out all the bikes and so on. Now they're going to be walking probably more heavily in some of these other side street areas because they're not going to have that initial, you know, stretch on Main Street where most people congregated. So now you're actually likely to have even more pedestrians walking where there's the, the, now this two-lane traffic. So for myself, I actually, um, I support um, the idea of switching that back to the two lanes in Port Dover and again, at least it, it shows our constituents that we're hearing, you know, we can't fix all the changes that they want, um, but we are hearing them and we are willing to listen and, and, uh, and, and make those kind of changes incremental. Let's see how
how the parking goes on Main Street with those changes, with the changes with the food vendors, and and let's kind of reevaluate how how that looked on the side streets for for the next event. Councillor Rabbits. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, I think at this juncture in time, I've, I've heard enough information that I'd feel comfortable putting forward a motion to waive the rules of order to entertain Councillor Marsh Martin's um, motion. I got that out. Um, in previous discussions at the Emergency Management uh, Committee, we have had a robust discussion about uh, the potential for an accident with vehicles and pedestrians mixing, not only with bicycles, but with uh, cars and trucks and uh, the various commercial vehicles that do uh, distribute um, their goods throughout this event and hearing what I've heard uh, about the concerns uh, and this is for the first time with that two-way traffic from the residents and those commercial businesses I think it is prudent for us to revisit this subject at a later date it seems like the the more uh, cautious approach or the safer option would be to have a one-way um, traffic flow through that area and if but Mr. Kirtland would like to respond with the emergency management comments that I made. It's not necessary, but um, it is a discussion that's taken place, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not too sure if it made its way through uh, to council uh, when we made that decision. We didn't have any comments from that board come forward. So I wanted to voice them at this time. I think it uh, would be something that we should do, and I'll, I'll put the motion forward to waive the rules so that we can hear the motion. Okay, so motion to waive the rules of procedural order, seconded by Councillor Taylor. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Councillor Martin. Thank you to my colleagues. Through you, Mayor Chop, to, oh, oh, okay, sorry, my apologies. Um, I can just kind of explain. Um, so the, technically, this is the only council before, and you're talking about amending a bylaw. So there's only one way I can figure of doing this without calling a special council meeting before um, September 17th. So it's very tough to change something that's in a bylaw but i think there's a motion that it will probably work for this that delegates mr cridland authority to do this okay okay so the motion reads as follows uh, that section 12 of bylaw 2019-59 be amended to de delegate authority to the general manager of account community services to change parking restrictions and apply one-way traffic restrictions on St. Andrew Street and St. George Street. Uh, can I just ask, what are the changes to the parking restrictions? So I haven't had time to review 2019-59 in totality, but I believe part of the, it, it, there's nothing with the two-way mentioned directly in there. I think what's in the actual bylaw is a restriction on parking on both sides of that street. And what Councillor Martin was saying was that motorcycles will be parked on both sides of that street so we need to remove uh, mr cridlin will need to remove any parking uh, restrictions or no parking area on those uh, uh, along with the one way okay um, but we don't know right now if it uh, i believe when we discussed it it was one side of the street was no parking previously but y you you can take that back and this gives you authority to do what was previously done okay so just so we're clear then it is parking on both sides and one-way traffic is what we're moving in this motion, and that's that's kind of the authority that's being delegated should it pass. Yeah, through through the mayor to county council, I would say it would go back um, to to where to where it was for the last event. Perfect. Okay, so we're not adding parking, we're not taking parking away, we're putting parking where it was with the one-way street, not the two. So okay. just like the old days, and, and it's motorcycle parking only. So perfect. Okay. Okay, and further that council. Um, rely upon the confirming bylaw of 2019-87 as the enacting bylaw for this amendment. Very clever. Uh, so moved by Councillor Martin and seconded by Councillor Rabbits. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor? And that is carried unanimously by Council. I think Port Dover will be happy. Um, okay, so uh, now we're on to our new general announcements section. Anything from anyone on staff? Mr. Baird. Mayor Chop, just very briefly, uh, we've got a number of major construction projects that are uh, underway or will be imminently. We just want to apologize for the inconveniences, the detours and the construction that's created. This really wet season is also hampering uh, efforts, but um, we'll do our best. We're dealing with those and uh, uh, any suggestions or concerns can be directed to our department. And uh, it's nice to see uh, the, probably the big paving project. We've got Highway 24 here from Simcoe down past the Turkey Point Road. 
will be starting on September 3rd. And uh, that will inconvenience a lot of drivers uh, in various sections because it is one of our higher volume routes. So I just wanted to share that uh, with you. While we're on that subject, if I could ask a question about road closures, would you be able to fill me in? I, I keep hearing a rumor about some road construction that is supposed to take place in Port Dover on Main Street before Friday the 13th for some connectivity uh, that wasn't properly done from really somewhere around Rolston's. There, they, um, Rolston's went to connect and, and now it's looking like the road might have to be dug up there. And I, the last rumor I heard was that was happening before Friday the 13th. That's kind of making me a little nervous. Yeah, no, um, I'm not specifically aware. I will follow up. I know Rolston's as part of their expansion for their medical center is going to be tying into existing services, but um, you know, they're fully permitted to do so, but we'll, we'll make sure that that's well after Friday the 13th. I know there's been some back and forth with uh, the, the, uh, the engineer, the developer, and, and uh, the owner. So I'll make note of that. If, if you could do some d a little bit of um, investigating as well as why that connectivity wasn't there in the first place from when they just did the road last year. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you. Uh, we have a couple interesting pieces of information within our information package this evening that I wanted to draw attention to. The first of that being um, we had asked for a list of county land assets, and we have um, a rubric provided to us that lists uh, 489 parcels. It's on page uh, 49 of the council information package, um, and it lists a variety of different types of uh, parcels. Um, I appreciate that that's uh, some information that uh, we had asked for and was com compiled in a timely manner. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more information in the, in the future in terms of where these land assets are, what they entail. We have hectares uh, and acres. We know the number of parcels and their general use, but it would be of uh, a great benefit uh, for this council to delve into where these parcels are located and what the general use is. I'm particularly interested in the vacant lots, of which there are, uh, are over 900 acres that are county-owned. Uh, so again, that's within the information package this evening. I just wanted to draw attention to that and thank our staff for their hard work on compiling this information. Uh, also, we have uh, a list of legal proceedings against Norfolk County. And so if that was information you're interested in, um, that can be found on page 52 of the, the package there. So um, worthwhile information, something that our council has requested and our staff have complied and produced that information for a review this evening. Thank you, Councillor Hoffman. Councillor Hoffman, I saw your... I'll, I'll let Shelley... Did you have something to add to Okay, that? no, it wasn't a general... I thought this was the general announcement it, portion it, of the meeting and we're, we're not doing business or anything like that. That was the... The reason I let them go because it was specific to what was in our information package this evening and I think I too... Okay, um, earlier we actually had had motions and finished with some items and we came back to them. So sometimes I just wanted to give Councillor Rabbit some flexibility. Shelley, did you have something to say there? Thank you, Mayor Chop, and to Councillor Rabbit. Uh, yes, we have a detailed uh, information summary on uh, the land, surplus land. We talked about the 489 parcels. Uh, we've compiled a very detailed spreadsheet uh, through the GIS department. So we do have a detailed listing and we have attached mapping that we can send out as a link. As you can appreciate, it was well over 500 pages, um, but um, it provides some some mapping, some roll number information, the MPAC use, and some addresses. So we can certainly send that out to Council uh, to take a look at. That would be great, thank you. And I appreciate you asking that question, Council Roberts, because they did put an enormous amount of work into this, and I too was uh, wondering the same thing and just forgot about it earlier. Well, we never really had a chance until now, so thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Columbus. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have three items I wanted to mention. Well, Councillor Geisens and Councillor Van Passen and I attended uh, a training session for our new fire recruits at the Fire Academy in uh, Delhi on Schaefer Road. And it's uh, really, really some intensive training that we witnessed. It was called a flashover, I believe, and uh, where they went into this sea can container, lit a fire, I think it was 240 degrees in there, full of uh, smoke, yeah, and odors and whatever. 
and uh, really they showed us a, a, what they're up, up against when they actually fight one of these flashover fires. Uh, the other thing I want to mention was there seems to be a disease out there that's attacking our Norway maples. There's a whole street in the town of Delhi, and 2nd Street, 2nd uh, Avenue, 1st Avenue, Callens Avenue, where limbs are actually dying right on the trees. It's pretty stark looking. I spoke to Adam Biddle from our forestry department. He says they're trying to get a handle on it. It's going to be tens of thousands of dollars to repair, and some of the trees will, he suggests that they will probably die. So we'll have to look at that in the new budget, I believe. Hope a lot of the residents would like to see this material cut out right now, but uh, there's no budget for it. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is all the best to Harry Schlanger in his new position with the town of Grimsby. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to, uh, first of all, thank everyone that was involved with the variance report. I really want to thank you for that. I realize how much work went into it, so just truly thanks goes out to you for that. I would also like to wish Harry uh, best of luck. And also, there's a wishing well that's been set up at Kaylee's Restaurant. Um, not too long ago, a stone was thrown through their front door. So the wishing well is set up to raise money to replace the door. And then anything that is uh, above and beyond the cost of repairing or replacing that door is going to be donated to um, acquiring benches for the downtown through the BIA. So that campaign is going to go until August 31st. Thank you, Councilor Taylor. Anyone else? Okay, well, now that Council has Megan, um, we're getting organized. So I've got a couple of events to talk about. So this is exciting. Um, Flag Canada uh, has, um, they uh, offer meetings for uh, peer support for individuals and families and friends with questions or concerns about sexual orientation and or gen gender identity issues. And they are having an open house uh, on the first, or I, I guess, sorry, rather a meeting the first Wednesday of each month from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Simcoe branch of the Norfolk County Public Library here in Simcoe. And uh, the next one is the International Overdose Awareness Day of Haldeman, Norfolk. And that is taking place on Saturday, August 31st, 2019 from 1 to 4 p.m. at uh, the Tobacco Museum uh, in Delhi. So everyone is welcome to that. Uh, the other piece, I don't know if anybody else attended bright and early this morning, but uh, Nanakoke as we know it is no longer. That was uh, pretty incredible to watch out there today. And uh, finally, I guess just a big thank you from me too to you, Harry. We're, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to miss you. And uh, I think we've all learned a lot even in this short period of time. And you were invaluable at Roma, or at AMO rather, I should say. And uh, thank you. Good luck at Grimsby. Council won't be nearly as fun. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Anything? All right. So with that, um, finally, a bylaw then, uh, shortest council meeting I think we've had, that 2019-87 uh, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of Norfolk County at this council meeting held on the 22nd day of August 2019 be approved, signed by the mayor and clerk, and affixed with the corporate seal. That's moved by Councillor Huffman and seconded by Councillor Van Passen. All those in favor? That's carried. And finally, the council be adjourned at 5.32 p.m. Moved by Councillor Van Passen and seconded by Councillor Huffman. All those in favor? And council's adjourned. You wanted six? You were, you were right. <laughs>